say, like Pierre said, um, I do some stuff with SAS. I'm a front-end developer. Um, I curate a weekly newsletter uh, with a collection of fantastic SAS articles, code pens, things like that. I'm just about to start a um, quarterly, hopefully, London meetup for SAS fans. Um, RYD Calc was a calculator I developed when responsible design sort of came out so that for developers that still get PSDs as a, a handoff so you can quickly create um, percentages from your pixels. And then uh, yesterday, um, I've just joined sitepoint.com part-time as a um, editor for their SaaS channel. So that's pretty fun. So I love the Zanya. This guy here, Garfield, he loves lasagna too. You could probably go back in my lifetime to the point where his love of lasagna had an impact on me. Um, and uh, whenever I get a chance to have a basket of chips pub meal, I usually opt for lasagna. My mum made a mean lasagna. She probably still makes a mean lasagna. When I was growing up, I think it was the sweet taste of the balsamic vinegar that came through. When I started to cook, I think lasagna was probably one of the first three dishes that I tried to make. Um, and I think I make a mean lasagna too, but it's different to the lasagna my mum made. It's probably got a little bit more balsamic vinegar than it should, and it's probably got a lot more cheese than it's probably healthy, but it tastes good. But what's this got to do with web development? Well, I probably write my code a little bit differently to you two. I only use the margin and padding shorthand and not the background or font shorthand. I write my CSS alphabetically, um, nest my SAS three levels deep, and order the nesting of things in a certain way. Yeah, the browser at the end of the day will serve the smallest minified gzipped humanly unreadable files it can do. But that doesn't stop me from writing code as verbose as needed to make it easily maintainable and readable to start with. I think and believe using your own set of starting files, creating your own framework, is the best way to hone your skill set and improve, not only for you and your team's benefit, but also for your clients and their customers also. So by making your code delicious and taking the time, it helps you care about your work and it makes you making you aware of what you're doing, just giving you an inner understanding of what you're doing, with an added bonus of helping others comprehend what you're doing and what you've done. <coughs> um. So I'm using the word frameworks, but people use boilerplates, frameworks again, systems, libraries, starting kits. But I'm going to use the word framework. Uh, in the English, Ox English Oxford Dictionary, the term framework is frameworks defined as an essential supporting structure of a building, vehicle, or object. So our framework is an essential supporting structure of files for the website. Using the term as framework as a catch-all to mean a collection of files that were potentially by either and or HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, be it with a preprocessor like SAS or CoffeeScript, or templating language like Haml, or what some developers often refer to as vanilla code. So when I say framework, what do I mean? Basically, I mean HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. But as my talk's about making your code delicious, it's about HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Essentially, again, making your codes for websites. But there's so many web uh, frameworks out there. We've got a vast choice of ready-made repos already to use, like the HTML5 boilerplate, that was one of the first frameworks I found um, and started to use heavily when I got back into making websites from my college years to doing sound engineering to trying to be a rock star to get in a real job. And, um, and it, started, uh, it started by some clever people. It's iterated upon and improved upon by some clever people, and it's kept up to date. 
Uh, I think the skeleton was one of the first ones I saw when responsive web design sort of came to the forefront of our industry. Um, Bootstrap, uh, developed by um, Mark Otto and Jacob um, from Twitter at the time. Um, it came along with some predefined CSS, some grids, and some objects. Uh, Bootstrap, uh, no, but not Bootstrap. Foundation, created and maintained by the Zurb Web Agency, with many fingers and many pies in California. We've got frameworks from individuals, like uh, Harry Roberts, uh, Inuit, UU CSS framework. Uh, Rockhammer from Andrew Clark of Stuff and Nonsense with some default styles and CSS and HTML patterns. Sasparilla for some guys at FIFA Function in the west of England, uh, which highlight on grid, grid systems and uh, a default typography base. A chap called Todd Motto, um, a Google developer evangelist, I think, um, who's created a nice and clean, ready to roll WordPress theme. HTML bones from Ian Devlin, which basically is like the boilerplate, HTML5 boilerplate, but stripped back to sort of the bare essentials, to the bones of it. And then you've got the HTML5 template by Drew McKellum, which is probably a, perhaps a little bit tongue in cheek. And then recently, Google have just jumped in with a massive starter kit to get you going. So you could say there's a framework explosion. Because there's lots. I think it's a funny thing that happens when you're developing with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Is that you're doing your good job building a decent website for your client. You're being productive and you're being smart. And then you realize that you can sort of abstract some of the stuff you've made and make it more simple. And then you go, all of a sudden, that you can make your own massive framework that everyone should use because it's the best thing ever. You become the Moodle arm of web development. But all of this has happened before. If we can just go back in time for a little bit, back to 2008, an event apart, San Francisco. Eric Meyer gave a talk on the lessons of CSS frameworks. In it, he discussed um, the 960 grid system by Nathan Smith, Blueprint, the Yahoo UE library, and went through this, these systems plus another six or seven. Um, making the, creating a list of what was in these frameworks. And he found that in the frameworks there were a CSS reset, a layout system or predefined grid, some generic predefined font sizes, font weights, styles, families and colors, a print style sheet, um, some generic naming conventions, an HTML page of various complexity, and potentially some JavaScript or jQuery in there. At the event, there was Jeremy Keefe, live blogging the sessions of the whole conference. In the blog post for Eric's presentation, Jeremy writes, which one is right for you? So which framework is right for you? The answer was simple, none of the above. As we're in our DeLorean, can we go back another year to 2007, when Andrew Clark wrote about the, uh, his disdain for ready-baked cake mixes, preferring to crack open a few eggs and whisk up something from scratch? and not out of a packet, making something that you could say tastes delicious rather than is tasteless. In a comment by Jeff Croft, he suggests that some instant cake mixes do have their places. I think if we transpose Andrew's blog post from cakes to frameworks, then do many of the frameworks like Bootstrap Foundation and the others I've shown you have their place? Of course they do. <clears throat> Some of the available frameworks are great for prototyping sites in the browsers, uh, making, creating the website, the bits needed, and how it might look really simple. Mark Otto wrote in a list of art article that, about Bootstrap that it was originally intended for internal tools so that if you needed so something, if you need something for your agency that's internally used, why not use 
something like Bootstrap to save you a little bit of time and a little bit of money. And that's um, Gunnar's Gunnar talked about Bootstrap earlier with the Iron Developer uh, tweet about Bootstrap and about it referring it to something from IKEA. <coughs> so, I'd suggest that there are good and bad points with uh, with frameworks, bootstrap, uh, with boilerplates, starting kits. So let's just go through some of those. Let's go through the good first. You get a speedy setup time. So you just download the repo and you're good to go. The work's already been done for you, so you don't have to really make too many decisions. You probably, you know, nine times out of ten, there's stuff made ready for you just to drop into your page. It's maintained by somebody else, and generally they've good support on issues. But there's also bad things about frameworks and boilerplates. They're maintained by somebody else. The subjective decisions have been made as to why something's coded that way and not the way you want it. They might shrivel up and die. And I personally think they're mainly bloated. So talking about bloat, why not? A mega, mega Big Mac, I think. I just took a couple of frameworks and looked at their minified C CSS. So the Gumby framework has a minified CSS of about 43 kilobytes. Not too bad. Bootstrap's minified CSS is 110 kilobytes. Foundation, um, I did a workshop with a client in Bath and they use Foundation, and I was quite surprised to realize that the minified CSS for Foundation was 140K. I thought it was a bit smaller than Bootstraps, but... So you've got those good and bad points. You've got the bloat. You've also got issues as well, because other people maintain it and other people use it. Other people find the issues that sort of can cause you problems as well as them. So if you're developing just for yourself, for your team, chances are those issues will probably get squashed a lot quicker. So if we go back to HTML5 boilerplate, back in 2012, I think, Josh Brewer wrote on Twitter, nothing says I used the HTML5 boilerplate without paying attention to the CSS, like the hot pink background color for selecting text. I got annoyed with this in 2011, so did Paul Robert Lloyd, so we started an issue, or Nicholas started an issue for us. Um, and that was probably the time I decided that I shouldn't be using someone else's boilerplate. I should probably just rip it apart and write my own. Because as Jeremy pointed out with this quote, it's like, you could transpose it to building a boilerplate is political and reflects the choices, biases, and desires of the creators. So it probably doesn't reflect on what you want it to do. Stephen Hay was on a podcast with the responsive design weekly newsletter recently, and he said, and I quote, sometimes you need to make your own framework, not because nothing else out there is good, but because it's good to learn as well. So I believe that we should be rolling our own. But not reinventing the wheel, because otherwise it gets to the point where it's happening exactly like before. So what would I put in a framework? I'd probably put a CSS reset and some helpers, a layout system or a predefined grid, some basic font sizes, weights, styles, families and colors, some generic print styles, some definition of some naming conventions, a blank HTML5 page, probably some jQuery and blank JS files. It is exactly happening exactly like it did before. How do I do this? I think it's good to beg, borrow, and steal code of others because they've already done the hard work for you, like I pointed out in the good thing of frameworks.
So basically, you should go through other available frameworks and read what they've got. And if you like it, take it. This one is um, the HTML5 Bones um, HTML page. And basically, you can see everything's nice and clearly sort of commented. So you can see what's it doing and why is it doing it. So it's a good, it's a good one just to sort of take from that the ARIA role stuff for when I developed my little boilerplate, because it was well explained, so I knew what I was putting in my code. Um, the HTML classes from Bootstra uh, from Boilerplate that are no longer in Boilerplate, um, I've borrowed as well, because I still have to sometimes develop for IE 7 uh, recently. So it's good to have the option to be able to use CSS class names in the HTML to do that and just go through other ways of people writing their CSS or their SAS. So you can just sort of get a feel of what they're doing. And if you like it, just sort of transpose it into your, your framework. So you sort of edit what you need rather than rewrite or reinvent the wheel. So this is my reset. It's pretty much the same as the uh, Nicholas Gallagher's normalize.css or .scss. But I prefer to have my margins and paddings reset um, just for a mental model of what I'm designing. So I've just used exactly what normalize is and just added that bit of CSS in to just sort of help me get along. So you can see at the top is the, excuse me, the uh, old HTML5 boilerplate code with the uh, class names at the top. Um, what I've done at the bottom is basically just rip out the ones I generally just need. I've also, as well as part of my um, satisfaction, my boilerplate, my framework, I've also got like a sub part which is for um, using SAS to basically on top of Andy Clark's universal IE6. I've moved it up to IE7. So, and it's using SAS so you can style it to give a sort of instant bit of theming for your clients work for free. And then I find if you add reusable code, you create, so if you're doing some projects and you find that you're having to write something and you probably need it again, it's good to just add it back into your framework. Um, I don't know if you saw on the previous slide, I only go, I only use the less than IE8 or less than IE9 tag in my HTML class rather than do all the variants that there were in the original, were in the original HTML5 boilerplate because I um, use this form of CSS hacking to get the, um, if I need to, for my clients, get the relevant sort of hacks in for the relevant old browsers. So there's that one. Um, it's quite heavily SAS-based, this stuff. Um, so this is just like a simple media query mixing I created so that I could then um, take the content of within the media query and export it out to a less than IE9 bit of uh, CSS so that rather than just give IE6, 7, and 8 a linearized um, basic, you know, hardly styled sort of bit of HTML in, a, in their web page, they, get, they can actually get some of it, perhaps, you know, whether it's a fixed width at 960 somehow, using that sort of mixing. And then for typography, I've just created a, a monolith of being able to set your own line heights and set your own margins or not set your own line heights or to create sort of your own sort of your base vertical rhythm typography. So if you go back to the slide, I'm not, I've not got it next, of um, Drew McKellen's HTML5 temple, which is basically, you know, nothing there. I prefer to throw in the kitchen sink and remove the code I need rather than forgetting to include it. 
So if you look at my basic HTML, you'll probably see there's modernizer in there somewhere, maybe. It's probably off the grid. But yeah, I give like the full fat modernizer. I think I did have respond.js in there, but I've taken it out. Because I think I'll forget to include it personally rather than not forget to take it away because you can spend forever testing and then all of a sudden you've forgotten to include your print style sheet or you could forget to include the HTML5 shiv. The one I always see quite often that's forgotten is the viewport meta tag when someone's released a newly responsive website. Lara Hogan uh, loves donuts and she celebrates every career achievement with a donut and I thought that was a really good idea, especially as I'm sort of yeah, only just started, it would be a nice way to sort of document how well I'm doing or not. So, And I had the idea, as soon as she published that site, I've been wanting to do it, but it's just been taking ages. So I had a spare half an hour, I think I was waiting for a client call. So I just quickly ripped out Drew's HTML5 template to knock up a quick, quick homage to my celebration of cakes of various, various calories. Um, but then I tried it on my phone, and I forgot the I forgot the meta viewport tag, so my phone, uh, my site looked like that with the odd lemon drizzle cake in the middle there for some reason. Um, and then like you've got the CERN website will look like that on your phone because obviously at the time the meta viewport tag wasn't invented. I think it was created by Opera. If you probably go back through. The the uh, reading the lists, you probably find that Hicksy probably wrote it. Maybe. So yeah, so I always make sure that we include that one because it's not there so, and I've forgotten it before. So I'm sure it's quite easy to forget. So once you've decided you've got all your code you need, it's pretty good to document what you're doing and why. As Mae West, the American actress, singer and playwright, once said, she kept a diary, and someday it will keep you. So if you doc the code, document the code you're writing now, it will probably help you in the future or somebody else that's using your product. You can go to something like uh, Nicholas Gallagher's idiomatic CSS, see the principles he's got. Well, basically, the idea is to read and just transpose what you think you want in your documentation. Uh, Sam Richards from IBM recently launched North, which is same similar ilk. Harry Roberts has pushed his what was on GitHub CSS guidelines to an actual website, which he's developing daily and updating daily. So you can go to these other pieces of documentation and decide what you want for yourself, whether you want to have tabs or spaces. Spaces, two of two spaces, whether you want to write font shorthand or be verbose and write it each uh, declaration on one line, I prefer the bottom one because it, I'll probably get, I always get the font size and line height mixed up. Or whether you want to write it all in one line or on a separate line each, obviously it gets minified and g-zipped. So you might as well be verbose as possible, I think. Whether you want to include the semicolon at the end of your CSS or not, just so that other developers sort of stick to your rule set. If you're going to add the fact that you've got closing sort of comments to your HTML tags. And then in the CSS itself, whether you sort of give it some rough documentation like this at the top, or give it some sort of more verbose stuff there. And when you're documenting, you can decide whether you want to use something like BEM um, as your, as your as when you're writing your CSS class names, so you've got your block and your element and your modifier. Or whether you want to use something like Smacks. So you've got your base file, your layout file, your modules, your states and your theme. Or if you want to use something like um, Nicholas Gallagher's suit CSS, for UI components. When you're documenting, you might also want to decide how you're going to partial your SAS if you're using a preprocessor. Um, 
and then you, if you write SAS as well, you might want to document how you write it as well. Um, so basically, that's how I write my SAS. So fundamentally, it's all about choices. But I think really, time's too short, so we shouldn't sweat the details. And I'll say it again, because time's too short. Although, I think we can iterate. So even though you can't do it now, well, no, try and do it now for tomorrow. Keep on iterating. Don't just leave it to sort of sure up and die. And the web moves pretty fast as well, so chances are what you're writing today probably might not work in you know, a month's time or when SAS 3.3 gets updated to 3.4. So if we go back about my idea of what we should be doing with frameworks is so that we can help you care about your work and it makes you aware of what you're doing, gives you an understanding of what you're doing, and it helps others comprehend what you've done also. So I think we should just be making our code delicious. But fundamentally, all of this has happened before, and all of this will happen again. Thank you. Uh, Stuart Robson is my Twitter and my website.